Thanks everyone for joining us today. So polar amplification is uh, the idea that high latitudes warm at a significantly greater rate than the global average. Uh, that's been studied with observations and in models, um, but its causes and consequences are not completely understood. So there has been this um, uh, polar amplification model in a comparison study. It was an endorsed MIP of CMIP-6, and we previously had a meeting uh, before CMIP-6 uh, began as an introduction to, to PayMIP. And so we thought it would be a good idea to have a, a second meeting to go over uh, recent results. Um, so, and in this meeting, we wanted to focus a little bit more on um, the responses to polar, potential responses to polar amplification and also the, the physical mechanisms. So our first speaker today is Dr. Hailin Wang. He is an Earth scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Washington State. He has been with PNNL since 2009. He received his PhD from the University of Illinois. And his talk is on increasing large, wild, increasing large wildfires over the Western United States linked to diminishing, diminishing sea ice in the Arctic. All right. Okay, uh, so do you see my full screen? I do, it looks good and we can hear you. Great, so yeah, thank you uh, Richard and uh, Hazel uh, for inviting me to give a talk uh, on this topic today. So before I talk, um, I first of all, I'd like to thank uh, our collaborators on this work, especially uh, Yufei, uh, he's able to make it to the uh, meeting today. Also, he's in the audience. Uh, so who did uh, most of the heavy lifting work. He's also the, the lead author on the paper I'm going to present. So this work has been uh, funded by the, uh, the US DOE uh, Regional and Global Model Analysis Program area as part of our uh, highlight uh, science focus area. Okay. So uh, as... Uh, Richard mentioned in the introduction that uh, the global temperature has been increasing uh, since the pre-industrial era, uh, primarily related to human activities. And however, uh, Arctic warming has outpaced the global mean since uh, 1980s. Um, and the, uh, at the same time, the Arctic sea ice has been decreasing either as a response or driver of the optic amplification as, as shown in this top panel figure. Uh, the time series of sea ice uh, extent uh, has been decreasing uh, dramatically since the uh, late uh, 70s. At the same time also uh, uh, in the wildfires in the western U.S. are getting uh, worse as shown in the bottom uh, figure here. Uh, both the uh, fire uh, number uh, in uh, blue line here and the burn area in green line here, they're both increasing, uh, they both have increasing uh, trends. Uh, it's probably easy to understand that uh, the sea ice reduction and uh, fire increase uh, under the global warming and Arctic amplification, but whether the Arctic sea ice and the Western US uh, wildfires are directly connected is, is less uh, straightforward. There were some previous studies uh, have uh, suggested uh, a st statistical relationship between the two. Uh, so our recent study uh, explains how the two phenomena uh, over the distant areas are uh, connected. So uh, we first uh, use the ERA-5 reanalysis and uh, ice fire observations to identify uh, teleconnection uh, between the Arctic sea ice uh, reduction and the regional fire weather uh, uh, over the Western US. And um, so here, uh, the figure, let's start with the uh, panel B here, the two, time, uh, two lines for time series of uh, fire weather, uh, Fosberg fire weather index in red and uh, sea ice concentration in, uh, in the bluish color. 
uh, note that the CIS, con CIS concentration y axis on the left is uh, inverted to uh, show the uh, better show the correlation. So it, there's a clear, strong correlation between the uh, September to December fire weather index and the uh, uh, July to October sea ice concentration uh, in, the, in the Arctic. So uh, correlation, uh, negative correlation, pretty strong here. And if you look at the uh, spatial distribution of the correlation uh, in, uh, in the, uh, for over the Arctic, you see there's uh, particularly a strong uh, negative correlation between sea ice concentration and the fire weather over the Pacific uh, Arctic uh, sector over the Arctic. And uh, this, looking at the panel, uh, see here showing the uh, fire weather index. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So we, we further identified uh, six years of sea ice maximum, uh, sea ice concentration maximum, uh, and uh, six years of the sea ice concentration minimum in the uh, uh, red and uh, blue uh, triangles here. Then we did a composite on the uh, fire weather index difference. You see that uh, in panel C here, uh, during the, the red uh, colors show the, Fire weather index in the sea ice minimum years uh, has a high, higher fire uh, risk, especially over uh, the autumn and early winter from September to December. Those are the signals are all significant. And uh, the vertical bars here shows the burned, actual burned areas uh, change during the, uh, during the, uh, the, the, the years. So there's a clear increase of the uh, burning uh, actually occurred. So, uh, and here in the in the, the red blue color here shows the, the difference in fire weather index between the sea ice minimum and sea ice maximum years. There's a clear uh, increase of the fire risk over, over the entire Western US. So, um, we, th those uh, analysis are based on the, uh, the data set with, with long-term trends. We also did a detraining of the data that is shows the, the, is insen the results are, is insensitive to the removal of long-term trends, suggesting that this linkage is also robust across uh, interannual uh, timescales. So uh, since we have identified the, uh, the teleconnection, so the next uh, uh, natural questions will be, uh, uh, what, what, what is the physical mechanism underlying the, the Arctic driven teleconnection? And how important is this uh, uh, teleconnection compared to warming, uh, the global warming, as well as other uh, teleconnections associated with major climate variability? In the, in the past few uh, decades. So for, to answer those questions, we first uh, designed the climate model sensitivity experiment with the CESM model coupled with a regional uh, fire model uh, developed by uh, UFI. Uh, so, and um, we performed a 40-year control, control simulation with the climatology and then used the uh, the composite sea ice plus years uh, of uh, sea ice concentration and SST and sea ice minus years uh, with, of the sea ice and SST uh, over the Pacific sector of the Arctic to drive to as the perturbation uh, to run sensitivity experiment branched from the control uh, simulation. And then to answer uh, question number two, um, we uh, did comparison between uh, uh, quite a few uh, CMIP-6 models uh, of their MIP and MIP with uh, pre-industrial forcing experiments uh, to uh, understand the role of anthropogenic forcing. And we also use the um, signal to noise maximizing pattern uh, filtering method to um, separate a uh, forced uh, climate response from each other and also from climate internal uh, variability. So um, we use the, uh, the, the three or uh, the two uh, sensitivity experiments to understand the physical me mechanism. So in panel A here, um, showing that uh, 
for over the Arctic, the sea ice perturbation is prescribed the, to the experiment is pretty uh, um, uh, straightforward. There's a big difference in sea ice concentration. And we also see um, in the contour lines, uh, solid lines means the positive anomaly in the, uh, the 500 uh, hectopascal geopotential height and the negative anomaly over the uh, Alaska and Arctic uh, that region. So uh, we also over the US, Western US, the, sea, uh, the difference in fire weather index um, uh, between the, the, the two uh, experiments. So the, then the remaining panels show the uh, joint PDF uh, between the fire weather index, uh, fire uh, favorable uh, circulation index, uh, Z500I indicated here, uh, burn area, uh, fire number and size. Uh, so for the uh, sea ice um, minimum uh, uh, experiment uh, in, in red color uh, shading, red shading here, and for sea ice plus experiment in the bluish contours here. So they all show a positive, uh, positive uh, shift in, uh, in the sea ice minus uh, experiment. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, there's a sub substantial fire increase over the Western US uh, in terms of uh, burn area, uh, number of fires, fire uh, size, uh, as a response to the Arctic sea ice loss. And the positive shift uh, indicated here. And, and those, the, the uh, fire weather condition change uh, are, uh, can be attributed to the anomalous high pressure system over the Western US, reduced uh, precipitation uh, and increased surface temperature and also enhanced uh, uh, vapor pressure deficit. So uh, we further look at the changes uh, in atmospheric dynamics and the thermodynamics to understand the physical processes that uh, contribute to the sea ice uh, driven teleconnection uh, in uh, era five, uh, era five after the detrending and the CESM experiment we performed. So first of all, we see that um, uh, there's a consistent response uh, in all the three data sets suggesting that the, there's a robust dynamic, uh, dynamical link uh, on the different time scales in both uh, reanalysis and model results. So if you look at further look at the uh, first column corresponding to zonal mean temperature, uh, you see there's a strong warming over the Arctic uh, with increased um, uh, meridional temperature gradient uh, around, uh, around 60 and the decreased uh, gradient around 80. Um, and there's a poor, uh, poor shift uh, showing in the zonal mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the zonal mean uh, uh, the wind speed, uh, you can see that uh, as a characterization of the jet stream. So there's a clear shift in among all three uh, data sets. And then look at the th third column here showing the precipitation change and wind. You can see there's a dis decreased, uh, decreased precipitation over the Western US here, but uh, increase over Alaska and uh, Canada. And then the last column showing the surface temperature and the relative humidity you see is a hotter and drier surface weather over the Western US, uh, with, with, along with the, uh, the anomalous high pressure uh, uh, system I mentioned before. So we also looked at the uh, CIMIP-6 model experiment to see how important the teleconnection uh, is in the past uh, four decades also. The top rule here uh, is for the MIP experiment. The middle rule is the MIP uh, experiments uh, with uh, pre-industrial forcing. Uh, and the bottom is the difference between the two. So there's a a similar responses in the MF and MF is PI forcing experiment, suggesting that the dominant rule uh, for the uh, for the uh, teleconnection is from uh, ocean uh, like SST and sea ice uh, conditions, and uh, there's a the difference between the two simulations 
showing that there's the opposite, the canceled, the, there's the opposite climate effect of the anthropogenic uh, and uh, other uh, natural forces uh, in, included in uh, MF simulations. So then the, then the question is how can we uh, compare, uh, separate uh, the sea ice driven uh, uh, effect uh, versus the SST change? So uh, we use the apply the, uh, the signal uh, SMP uh, pattern uh, recognition method I mentioned before to the MIP model experiment, trying to separate uh, the forced uh, responses in fire weather uh, to climate variability uh, from uh, climate variability such as ENSO. So we, it's applied to multiple fields. The, the patterns uh, showing here on the left two Left panel showing is uh, for, uh, for the Arctic related patterns and the right, uh, right hand side showing the ENSO related uh, patterns in the MIP uh, uh, experiment. They, they actually show uh, very comparable and constructive responses in the surface weather conditions like the surface air temperature, precipitation and, the, and the, um, the circulation pattern indicated by the 500 hectopascal uh, uh, geopotential height anomaly. And so we further examine the robustness of the uh, teleconnection across all the CMIP6 models that participated in, uh, in the MIP experiment as shown in the top panel. Uh, here, uh, there's a, there are consistent and robust correlations among Arctic sea ice concentration, the circulation pattern index and fire weather uh, condition across uh, 12 out of the 15 models we used. And the bottom panel showed the, the total and Arctic related uh, differences in between sea ice minus and sea ice plus years uh, in precipitation in the uh, left column and fire risk in the, in the uh, right column. So the amplitude, amplitude of the Arctic related fire weather changes of similar magnitude to other leading modes of the climate variability that considered included in the total response here. So to summarize, uh, in this study, we show that in a, the diminishing Arctic sea ice directly contribute to the worsening wildfire over Western United States. We first identify a teleconnection linking, linking the two based on observational data and then designed climate model experiment to understand the, the sequential physical processes triggered by the Arctic sea ice loss. Um, the top panel, we use a schematic here to show step-by-step step how the tele teleconnection works. Uh, when summer sea ice is reduced, ocean can absorb uh, and store more heat from the sunlight. Uh, less sea ice converge, uh, uh, less uh, sea ice coverage will also allow more heat to be released from ocean and atmosphere in the, in the following autumn and winter, winter season, uh, which uh, the anomalous heat will uh, form rising air and, uh, and strengthen the lower, low pressure system, which will push the polar jet stream to tilt more uh, to the south north uh, uh, alignment which facilitate the formation of the high pressure over the western us and then uh, uh, the uh, the this high pressure and the less moisture transported to western us will facilitate uh, form the fire uh, favorable uh, weather uh, the little cartoon ca cartoon here <laughs> animation here further uh, desc describe the process and uh, with that, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and here is the reference of the paper uh, we published. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I should point out that uh, Yufei Zhu was the first author on this, and he's on. He's actually on the call. But um, we we asked you for the presentation. You, you showed us this one. Um, I just wanted to to clarify uh, how long the uh, the fire res component. So. Um, it provides an estimation of occurrence and spread of wildfires, and uh, there's a two-way coupling. Is that right? Um, so in this, in this, uh, in those, in those sensitivity experiments, we, I believe, we only uh, turn on the uh, impact of the. Uh, it, it, are you talking about whether the fire emissions would further affect uh, uh, the climate? It has the right. capability. 
in the CSM rest fire model, but I believe in this uh, in those experiments we didn't turn on the on, there's only one way. The, so I see. So you think you may clarify if you want, if I correct me. Yeah, from. yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah. So how long you are right? We only consider the one way impact mm -hmm. of the CS change on the regional fairways and the burn area responses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in our previous study published in 2020, uh, we examined the fire feedbacks to the climate system, and uh, we found that this uh, feedback impact is secondary or, uh, yeah, in, in terms of the magnitude. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh. Okay, are there any other quick questions before we, uh, Jack Dib, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I was just curious. I was trying to look at some of the different maps, but it looked like the uh, increased fire risk or fire weather or whatever was uh, not really impacting the extreme northwestern U.S. and like British Columbia. And I wonder if that makes sense because it seems like they're having ever increasing catastrophic fires exactly there. And all of this seems like it's less intense from your modeling than what I was going to ask about different. Alaska as well, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. At least for uh, based on our observation analysis and model sensitivity experiment, actually there, yeah, it does show that the precipitation is increasing over Alaska, over the the higher latitude of North America. So the increasing trend of fire over those regions are probably more due to other uh, other mechanisms. I would say. Okay, we'll have time for additional discussion on, on this presentation um, towards the end here, but uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Lantau Sun. He is a research scientist at Colorado State University Department of Atmospheric Science in Fort Collins. He is also a graduate from the University of Illinois, so we have two Illini alum on uh, presenting today. Um, and his talk is on uncertainty in the winter tropospheric response of Arctic sea ice loss, the role of stratospheric polar vortex internal variability. Thank you. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, I can. Perfect, and perfect. Uh, if you could put your slides into presenter mode, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm so happy to have this opportunity to present some uh, PA map related work. Uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, Clara Desser, uh, Ella Simpson, and Michael Sigmund, and it has been published recently in Journal of Climate. Um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, firstly, uh, I want to give you a really quick contact. Um, so the figure here, um, you are probably familiar with that, is the a uh, winter surface air temperature trend for the 1990 to 2013 period, in which we can see a, uh, let me open the laser. You can, you can see the very strong Arctic warming uh, coinciding with the cooling over the middle latitude continent. So the question is, does this coinciding mean any causality, uh, or in other words, is the uh, Arctic warming or Arctic sea ice loss causing the cooling in the middle latitude continent? And uh, there has been some hypothesis on this connection, and it's, it's related to the stratosphere. Uh, we normally call it a stratospheric pathway so uh, this bottom schematic graph is remade from the 2014 paper here. Uh, the, this paper suggests that uh, sea ice loss in the Barents and the Kara Sea in winter can cause the uh, winter polar vortex uh, to weaken, followed by the uh, negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, or NAO, and the cold winter in the uh, Eurasia. And in this study, uh, we took a little different perspective by uh, looking at 
how the stratosphere polar vortex internal variability uh, obscures the tropospheric response. So the data uh, we are using is the uh, P map data uh, with the uh, CAM6 model. Uh, these are 14 months long atmosphere only simulations in which the radiative forcing is always fixed at the year 2000. And uh, we look at two simulations. And in the first one of the simulations, the Arctic sea ice concentration uh, are prescribed to be the pre-industrial level. And uh, in the second one, it's prescribed to be the uh, present day level. So the only difference between these two experiments are over the Arctic and it can be attributed to the Arctic sea ice loss uh, as shown on the right panel. And the other thing I also wanted to mention is that we follow the approach in CSM one large ensemble to construct 200 independent but plausible winter realizations. So in this way, we can look at the whole ensemble mean response to represent the uh, forced response to Arctic sea ice loss. And we can also look at the spread among ensemble members to understand the uh, internal variability. So now let's start to look at the uh, forced response in winter by examining the zonal mean, zonal wind response uh, in a function of uh, latitude uh, and height. These are 200 member averages. So we can see it as a, a forced response. The shading is for the response. Uh, those compares gives you the climatology and the stapling is for the statistical significance. So we know that as the Arctic warms, the meridional temperature gradient will decrease. As a result, we will expect the zonal wind to decelerate, which is exactly what we see here in both the troposphere and the stratosphere. Now, the interesting thing is that when we separate this whole 20, 200 members into the first 100 and the second 100 members, and then uh, re-examine re the uh, 100 member average response for these two 100 members, and we found a very different response. And in both the troposphere and the stratosphere, for example, uh, in the stratosphere, polar vortex weakens in the first 100 member average significantly, but the strengthens in the second 100 member averages, even though it's not statistically significant. And we can also look at the troposphere and see a lot of differences uh, in the first 100 member averages. We see a clear uh, zonal wind deceleration, but there are barely uh, any statistical significant signal in the second 100 member averages. So I wanted to uh, emphasize here that each member are independent and plausible. So uh, the, the different uh, response, uh, the inconsistency uh, between the first 100 member and the second 100 members averages indicate that atmospheric circulation response to Arctic sea ice loss subject to a lot of uncertainty, even for 100 members. So that's a lot of samples. And the next, we are trying to understand if the uncertainty in the tropospheric circulation response could be uh, connected to the stratosphere. And to understand that, uh, we pick the zonal wind at 10 hexapascal and the six degree north. So this one, this six degree north, 
10 hexapascal zonal wing is normally used to represent the uh, strength of the polar vortex. And what we did is that, you know, we have 200 members, so we can use this bootstrapping to randomly pick 100 members. And we can do that for 1,000 times and get a, a PDF for the zone one response uh, at 10 hexapascal and 6 degree north to give us how the uh, distribution to represent the stratosphere uh, polar vortex internal variability as shown on the right panel. And we can see that it's uh, approximately uh, linear, uh, uh, approximately uh, normal oh. distributed. And we can also look at the first 100 member average and the second 100 member average. And we can see they reside on the uh, two sides of the uh, distribution, indicating that it has a low uh, probability. And the next, we are trying to understand how the stratosphere polar vortex internal variability can impact on troposphere response. What we did is to uh, regress the sea level pressure and the two meter temperature response onto the polar vortex index that we just defined across this 1,000 bootstrapped 100 member averages. Uh, as the left panel of the figures gives you the troposphere response corresponding to the uh, two sigma uh, polar vortex weaker. And the middle panel gives you the tropospheric response corresponding to the uh, polar vortex strengthening by two standard deviation. And the right panel gives you the difference. And the sea level pressure response is shown uh, in contour with the red to be positive anomaly and blue is negative. And the shading is for temperature. We can see that when the uh, polar vortex is in different states, the sea level pressure response is also very different. And their difference, which shown on the red panel, gives you a, a pretty uh, nice feature of the negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation on Northern Annual Mole. And the temperature pattern is just, uh, can be understood as the fingerprint of the circulation response pattern. And the more interesting thing is that we can compare with the, um, the first 100 member average and the second 100 member average for the sea level pressure and, uh, and the temp surface and temperature response and their difference. We can see a lot of resemblance between the regression results and the uh, inconsistency between the first and the second 100 member averages. So this suggests that the inconsistency between these two 100 member averages uh, is largely coming from the uh, stratosphere uh, polar vortex internal variability. And so far, there are still two questions we haven't addressed. One is uh, how well the model can capture the observed polar vortex internal variability. So to understand that, we have uh, calculated the 95% a marginal error of two standard deviation on a 50-year trend in sea level pressure and two meter temperature associated with the polar vortex internal variability. So we can do this estimate solely based on the reanalysis data. And we can also do that based on the model data. As we can see, these two are very similar to each other exhibiting this familiar uh, AO pattern and its temperature fingerprint. So I want to mention that the, the sign here doesn't matter because it can be uh, either positive 
uh, or negative, but the magnitude uh, does matter, give you some idea of the uncertainty if you want to look at the 50 year trend for time surface for sea level pressure and to meet the temperature. And the last question is uh, how large data this is compared to the forced response. So we cannot get it from observations, but we do have it from the PA map experiments. As shown here is uh, uh, sea level pressure and, and two meter temperature response to the uh, Arctic sea ice loss. It turns out that the, the sea ice loss in the PA map experiments is very close to the uh, 50 year sea ice loss in observations from 1971 to 2020. So this is the uh, forced response to roughly speaking 50 year CS change. And we can compare this forced response to the internal variability either in the model or in the reanalysis. Again, the controls is for sea level pressure and the uh, seeding is for temperature. Immediately, we can see that the, the forced sea level pressure response, the magnitude is much smaller than the internal variability, either in model or reanalysis. And similarly for the temperature over the middle latitude. So this suggests that it will be hard to isolate the uh, atmosphere response to Arctic sea ice loss from stratosphere polar vortex internal variability because of the low signal to, signal to noise ratio. And this is the conclusions. Uh, I will just leave them here and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lanto. I, I just wanted to ask a couple of clarifying questions. So you said you indicate that you used CAM6 yeah. So that's not the Wacom configuration then. Um, can, can you give a, uh, just a quick uh, difference on uh, the stratospheric representation between CAM6 and the Wacom uh, yeah, model? That's, that, that's a very good point. So CAM6 is, uh, we call it a low top model. So which means it can uh, not uh, represent the full stratosphere. So for example, if we look at the, the sudden stratospheric warming, uh, we, will see over, uh, we will see the underestimation of the sudden warming frequency compared to the observation, while the Wacom will show a much better number. Um, however, in this uh, case, we do look at the polar vortex internal variability in CAM6, and its impact on the troposphere, which shows very similar to the reanalysis data, suggesting that uh, it's still okay to use the uh, CAM6 model to look at this, even though it's not even though it's not perfect. Okay, and um, just uh, again to contrast with the the first talk, which which did use Wacom. Um, so uh, we had discussed this earlier that uh, you had focused on the, the winter time here, and these are variations in the, the winter time polar vortex. Um, can you speculate on uh, what the response to the sea ice changes would be uh, either in the summertime or in the transitional seasons? Uh, that's, that's a really uh, good point. I look at, uh, I look at the summer response uh, previously. I mean, I, I didn't publish into papers, but I do examine a little bit. I didn't see much circulation response. This is not very surprising because, you know, as we know, uh, CS loss in the summer will not cause much heat into the atmosphere. So it's supposed to have a small effect on the atmosphere, including atmospheric circulation in summer. Uh, I, I haven't looked at uh, what happened in the autumn, you know, what Hylon uh, has uh, presented. I think it will be super interesting to look at the, you know, the PA map data 
to see uh, how does the circulation response look like, in particular, if we have that high uh, over, the, over the United States. So just to be clear, uh, high lines plots showed some uh, so showed some difference plots, but those were during the entirety of the, the fire season. They included the uh, the transitional seasons into the autumn, uh, transitional months into the autumn. So um, uh, the the thermal differences in the summertime are pretty small, but once you get into the the autumn or so, you you would get a, a large uh, surface response. Um, Island, do you want to add anything to that? Um, not much to add, but your interpretation is correct. Yes, uh, the, the the response is more uh, more significant in the in the autumn and early winter season uh, to the sea ice loss. Yes. Okay, uh, Jack, your hands raised again. Would you like to ask a question? Actually, I, I had two questions, and one I think it, it could be answered from this figure that's still up on the screen. And it was actually the one just before it, where you added the before you added the third panel on the right. But the two on the left, and you say it doesn't matter that they got the sign of the Aleutian low anomaly wrong; it's still the same. I don't understand how you could say that at all, right? Um, I mean, everywhere except over the North Pacific, these two, the model and the reanalysis, look quite similar. But you got the wrong sign for the pressure anomaly over a huge part of the North Pacific and say that doesn't matter? Oh, no, no, that's that's not what I mean. What I mean is that we are talking about the, the, the uncertainty of two sigma. So in reality, it could be, uh, you know, plus two sigma or could be minus two sigma. So for example, it, in, 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 the, in the panel here, uh, it could be like a negative NAL pattern. But it could be positive on AO. The uncertainty doesn't really have a sign. That's what I mean. Uh, regarding what you said here in the North Pacific, yes, that's that's definitely important to understand. I think this is a uh, this is a common issue in the current climate model, uh, which is that the uh, the the model normal issue more like a name pattern while the observation more like the NAO. Uh, why is that? Uh, one, one, could, one, one possibility is that you know, model has some issue. The other possibility is that we, uh, the reanalysis have a very short length. So like only 50 years. Well, model you can have like hundreds of years or even longer. So when you have short lines and you also have, you know, uh, ANSO, a lot of tropical signals there, uh, then it tend to, to make this a little messy and it's harder for you to really get a clear signal in the North Pacific. Well, in the model, because we uh, prescribe the repeating signal cycle of the SST, it doesn't really have the ANSO signal there. So it, present more like a uh, annual pattern than what we normally see in the observations. Okay, I, I think I get that. But uh, my other question is way back at the beginning when you, okay. uh, you, you talked about these 200 member oh. ensembles Yes, and I'm having. I really don't understand statistically how you can take randomly the first 100 members of the ensemble and the second 100, and they're both almost outside the distribution of the whole 200 member ensemble that you later bootstrapped. How, how does that work? I don't yeah, it's. It. Uh, I I I, I, I see. Mean, does, does the first 100 and the second 100 progressively change things in the same direction? I mean, that seems really crazy to me. Yes, yes, I completely agree. Uh, I think this is a, uh, a, a very low probability event. Definitely, I, I will not expect, you know, like when you run 200 members, you will see much such difference. Uh, this is a rare event, but uh, it will not change the, uh, it will not change the internal variability. I mean, the distribution uh, and the polar vortex internal variability will not change. But it's definitely a, a low probability event. 
Actually, after we got these results, we can even question if something changes from the first 100 to the second 100 members. And we check this thoroughly and even, you know, to ask people to uh, rerun the experiment independently. And we always get the same results. So the only explanation I can get is it's a low probability event, but it does happen. That's a head scratcher, I'll say for sure, because what I think you're saying though is that the central histogram is based on those same 200 yes. ensemble members just sampled in different combinations of 100 over and over and over again. Yes. And it's like wacky that the first 100 and second 100 are so different. That just, yes. I don't get it. <laughs> it's, I mean, I mean, this is kind of just by chance. Like you, for example, if we, we run this put a trapping for 1000 times, it's definitely a low chance that you just go into the end of the, 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 the PDF, but it does happen sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't have other explanations for this. Uh, I, I would be happy to, 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 to take that if you have any kind of suggestions on why this could happen uh, due to other reasons. Well, I, I'm not thinking of any right away, but thanks. Uh, thank you. I think my interpretation. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Who is uh, that? No, no, you, you, go, you go ahead, please. Oh, um, I guess my interpretation of this is that um, the vortex uh, variability is somewhat bimodal and that this is that's being brought out by these uh, by these samplings. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And that would with that uh, variability. Um, I, I don't think you, you look for this specifically, but um, could could we suggest that that's uh, due to uh, stratus wintertime stratospheric warming or just uh, the mean strength of the vortex? Uh, I, I, I would suspect that uh, sudden warming is definitely one important factor because when you have sudden warming, the mean polar vortex will normally be weaker. If you don't, it will be stronger. This definitely causes a lot of difference uh, in the interannual variability in observations and similarly in the model. And uh, I, 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 I mean, uh, while these, these two events, why, you know, reside on the two sides of the distribution, it's by chance. I want to emphasize that this uh, PDF is, uh, I don't, should, uh, is very consistent with the uh, analytical solution. I mean, we can, we can calculate that based on the uh, interannual or standard deviation, and uh, we can get a distribution. Th th this line, this curve is actually, is calculated an analytically, and it's in good consistency with, with what, we, what we did with the bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. So just quickly, Lanto, do you think if you use a different model, 200 members, yeah. Osama members, could you reproduce this? Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good question. Actually, here I only uh, show like a two, I only show like a two experiments, which gives you like a one past the CS loss. But there are other CS experiments we have looked at. We actually look at four experiments. For the two experiments, they don't show much difference in the stratosphere polar vortex. For the other two, we do see. So this is kind of like a just a sampling issue. Some, sometimes you see, sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to add that a similar thing also happens in other models like a ECMW, ECMWF model. They also did the, the PA map experiments. They found some, some similar things. And their paper has been uh, published last year in Journal of, in Journal of Climate as well. Very interesting. Thank Thanks. you. Are there any other questions from anyone online?
so Lantau, your results are, I think they're broadly consistent with uh, a recent paper by, by Smith, um, which suggests that um, the response is, is relatively, relatively weak. Uh, they write that for any particular year, the um, uh, this would account, uh, polar amplification would count for about 10% of the variation. Um, I guess that's at mid-latitudes. Are there any other modeling studies out there that suggest a, a stronger response at mid-latitudes or has there has this become the consensus then? Uh, I, I can only speak for like a, some paper that I'm familiar with. Um, I think Yannick Pins has a paper published the last year using the Wacom to do some uh, experiments. And I think he found a similar thing. And his paper is also uh, talking about the, the, the internal variability uh, more in general, showing the inconsistency between the, the first, second, and even third 100 members. Uh, that's one thing I think is similar to what we found. Uh, the other one I just mentioned is this uh, ECMWF group. Uh, this is very interesting because their initial purpose is to examine the sensitivity to the horizontal resolution. So they wanted to look at the CS loss, but at a different resolution, like a 100 kilometer, 50 kilometer, or even like a 30 kilometers, and see if they can find any sensitivity. But it turns out that they found that internal variability is so large, they couldn't really attribute any difference to the sensitivity uh, in horizontal resolution. So in that context, it's also similar to uh, what we found here. Uh, I think there might be some group of, some French group uh, who also look at this, but I, I doubt they found the uh, very large response. Uh, overall, I feel like you know this modeling study results, the PA map results, are largely uh, in agreement with what's presented by uh, by Doug Smith's recent paper. So overall, it's small numbers, but it's robust. And do you think there'll be? Uh additional work on these transitional seasons, such as, as what uh, uh, Hylan and, um, uh, and Yufei have presented? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm very intrigued by Hylan's results. I really wanted to, uh, may, maybe I, I, I don't have to do that. I really think that some people should take a look at the, the PA map results because there are a lot of data there for people to look at the uh, autumn season circulation response. Uh, one, one thing I, I do notice is that, you know, in high loans experiment, the CS loss is prescribed in the Pacific region, right? Pacific sector of the Arctic. Uh, well, here, uh, most of the experiments that we, we see is like uh, over the whole Arctic. I don't know how much that could make the difference, but the PA map does have some experiment like 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 a Barents Karasi versus the uh, Pacific sector. I cannot remember the uh, the details for sure, but that maybe provide some some idea for the potential impact of regional CS loss effect. That's that's something I I feel like uh, you know worth looking at. Uh, the other thing is that uh, so far, uh, most of the modeling studies are only use atmosphere only model without considering the coupling with the ocean. That's definitely could be one caveat of the uh, current study. Uh, PA map does propose some coupled experiment and uh, maybe it will be good uh, you know, for some people to really uh, goes into the coupled model and and try to understand with ocean coupling uh, how does the circulation response might change. That's certainly uh, 
can add some new aspect to the current study. I totally agree with that, um, but it, but we've gone over time here. Uh, Hazel, is there any other bookkeeping we need to do? Oh, I think that's it. Just thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much for the presentations today. Um, and um, no, I, nothing else from me. Thanks, thanks so much to the speakers, and thanks for everyone who um, who who dialed in. Um, next month, the modeling team will have presentations on ocean reanalyses. And I think that's it. Thanks. Thanks again, everyone.